are you doing? It was Christmas morning. We were at her mom's house. My mother-in-law. She had all her family over. Grandmother. The aunts, the uncles. It was a beautiful day. Something straight out of a Hallmark channel. And I had asked my mother-in-law, what would you like us to do? Wear matching jammies? And she said, no, Brian, don't be ridiculous. Just look festive. And so I opened the door from the bedroom on the second floor where we were staying and announced with my arrival, Merry Christmas, everybody! And Brooke shook her head in shame and looked down. I took pictures with everybody. I walked around with a phone just taking selfies that they didn't ask for and never wanted to see, and I didn't care. Because I was told to look festive. Much more festive than this, quite frankly. If this doesn't put you in the Christmas spirit, I'm just going to say there's something wrong with you. All right? It's the most wonderful time of the year, after all. We hear that over and over again. Happy holidays. You hear that on repeat. And yet there's work expectations. There's decorations that you have to dig out and put up and debates about when you're allowed to put them up and when it's okay. And, and, and of course, if there's one stupid light bulb on that strand, it's going to be in the middle that burns out and then the whole thing isn't going to work and you're going to spend hours trying to figure that out. There's presents which lead to bills, which lead to stress. There's family time, which is great, and there's family time, which is family time. <laughs> there's, even, there's even one study that suggests you're more likely to have a heart attack around Christmas and New Year's with all the stress and all the things that were going on. And so today we kick off something we're calling the chaos of Christmas because Christmas should be a time of celebration. It should be a time of joy. It should be a time that we look forward to. And yet there's so many factors that, that can play in that make it sometimes anything but joyous and anything but a celebration. And so our goal over the next few weeks is to help you avoid all that. And to help you just rediscover the love of Christmas, to, to enjoy and, and to be a season that you actually look forward to. And that's what we're going to discuss over the course of the next few weeks. And today we start that discussion with what to wear. I look ridiculous, so I'm going to go change real quick. But what I want you to do while I do that is talk to the person next to you. And if you're an extrovert next to an introvert, you'll do all the talking. And if you're an extrovert next to an extrovert, this is only going to take a minute. And if you're an introvert next to an introvert, just wink and nod and you can sit in silence and it'll be great. <laughs> all right. But, but just find the person next to you and just tell them what you love most about Christmas. And I'll be back in like 30 seconds to a minute. <laughs> Introverts, fear not. The time is over. The reprieve is here. Extroverts, grab coffee after the service and pick up where you left off. That's, that's great. Hey, if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can, uh, you can join us today in Ephesians 4. We're going to be in Ephesians 4, and, and we, really, um, we really suggest that you have that, that app on your phone or your tablet. It's a great app. It's a great resource. It's completely free, and we believe the best way to grow closer to to the heart of God is to engage with God's word, and so we really encourage you to download that on your, your phones or on your tablets. But we're going to be in Ephesians 4 uh, today as we look at what to wear, what to wear. And just to give you a little bit of context of, of where we are in, in Ephesians 4 is the Ephesians are living in a dark world. They're living in a dark world, and we can, we can, certainly, uh, we can certainly sympathize with that. And we, we live in a, a time and in a place where we are just, just deluged with headlines day after day of just unspeakable acts and tragedies that occur on what's unfortunately becoming a, a normal basis. And we live in a very dark world. And the church in Ephesus, the, the Ephesians, they lived in a, in a dark world as well. Now, they dealt with different issues, but really, when you boil them down, they're really the same because they're... They're matters of the heart. And, and so what that looked like in terms of context looks a little bit different than what we deal with and what we engage with on a regular basis. But 
they lived in a dark world, and we live in a dark world. And the Apostle Paul, who under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, wrote the book of Ephesians, he, he wrote to them, and he draws a contrast. And so we're going to join in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 20, where we read this. And he's talking about the dark world in which they live. And then he draws this contrast. He writes, but this is not the way you learned Christ. But this is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So here's the context of the world. Here's the dark world in which we live. But as followers of Jesus, this is, this is to be different, he writes. This is not the way you learned Christ. Your conduct as a follower of Jesus needs to be different than the darkness that is all around you. And he draws that contrast in, immediately here. And he says, we need to live different lives as followers of Jesus. We need to conduct ourselves accordingly, and we need to conduct ourselves differently. And then he writes this, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And so he draws this contrast, and he says, you need to change. You need to change. To put off your old self, to take it off. What's natural? What comes to us without even having to think about it? All of these things, which, which define so many people around us, and honestly define each and every one of us at our core as well. Now, we can, we can play the comparison game, and when we look at the darkness of the world, we say, well, I don't take it to that extreme. But when you look at the anger and the bitterness and the rage and the hatred and all of the things that play into it, those are all seeds that are alive in us as well. And so he says, take off your old self. Take off those things. And this is why the message of the gospel is so offensive to people, because at the core of the message of Jesus is this message. You are not okay. You're not. That's just the reality. You are not okay. Put off your old self, which belongs to the way you used to live. As a follower of Jesus, change. Change. Live a different life. It's corrupt through deceitful desires. And here's the reality about desire. It feels good. And it always promises us pleasure. It always promises us a, a, a greater purpose or, or that we're missing out on something. And so when desire comes, it just it looks so appealing. And in the moment, it can be. But the path is always a path to emptiness. He says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. Stop living the way you're living. It's corrupt. It's corrupt through deceitful desires, desires that look so good, and yet at their core will lead you to a path of destruction and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. So you need to change your conduct. You need to change your way of thinking. You need to change your conduct. In order to do that, you need to change your way of thinking. You need to take off whatever it is that you wear, and you need to put on a new outfit. But it's going to require a change. And you need to change your conduct, but first you need to change your way of thinking. So take that off, he says, and do this. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Take off the old and put on the new. Now, here's the reality. This, at the moment of salvation, is a work of God. At the moment of salvation, this is a work of God. And some of you can attest to this because at the, at the very second you made the decision to turn your life around and follow Jesus, there was something that went on within you that, that you, can't, you can't even fully explain. But in that 
instant there was a change in desires that you had or there was a struggle that you had and it was instantly gone. And sometimes that happens instantaneous. Some people, at the moment they make the decision to follow Jesus, they're delivered from addiction and, and they, they have all kinds of things that they can look back and they can attest to. And it's a miraculous work of God. And some of this happens instantaneously at the moment of salvation because God comes and resides within us. But this is not universal. It's not that every addict who's ever made the decision to follow Jesus is delivered immediately. And it doesn't mean, by the way, that, that, they, don't have, that they don't have the Spirit of God living within them. Sanctification is a process. And what sanctification is, is it's a process where God, God takes us and He makes us more like Him. So if you've made the decision to follow Jesus recently and you look at your life and you're like, man, I'm, I'm still making some stupid choices. You're going to continue to make some stupid choices. But the goal is that you become more and more like Jesus. The problem is when there's no longer any progress. That's the danger zone. And that's not an excuse that after you've made the decision, if you're making progress, that you can just say, ah, well, making progress. I mean, you don't, you don't get to just hold on to it like that. But the real trouble comes where you're not moving any closer to Jesus anymore. And there's the subtle thought that you've arrived, that you've, you've come far enough. The work of God in making us more and more like him is never complete. It is never done. And the closer and closer we become to Jesus and the further and further we get from our old selves, the more we realize the further we have to go. So take off your old self. Take off what you're wearing and put on the new self. Change your conduct. Change your mindset. Realize that this is a work of God, and it's going to be some, in some aspects instantaneous, but in other aspects a work of progress. Therefore, verse 25 says, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So take off falsehood. Take off lying. And speak the truth. Now this is something that we can, we can all rally around. We can all say, well, naturally. We don't want people to be liars. That's right. You take off your old self and you put on the new. And we all understand this is a very basic tenet. And then the question comes after all the Christmas cookies. How do I look? <laughs> Thoughts and prayers. <laughs> Thoughts and prayers. Most of us don't have much trouble in lying about major things. It's what we think are just the subtle things, the small things, the things that don't really matter. And the truth is, when we start to get a little generous in our answers there, we start down a path. Now, this is, not, this is not an invitation to be a jerk. This is not an invitation to destroy people with your word. It's, it's, it's not that at all. But most of us, we... We understand this principle that we shouldn't lie. So it's not the big stuff that's going to be a struggle for us. It's going to be the small, subtle things that we don't think really matter. But if you, need, if you want to put on your new self, as you need to do, then you have to understand that falsehood of any kind, whether you deem it major or minor, needs to be gone. To put off the falsehood, and speak the truth to your neighbor. And one of the major reasons that this is so important is because we're a community. We're a community. And so trust has to be established and trust has to be built. And the moment you lose someone's trust, the second you lose someone's trust, it is nearly impossible to redeem it. It's, I'm not saying it can't be done. 
but it is incredibly difficult. And in some cases, it can never be done. Put off falsehood. Speak the truth. Take off lying. Put on the truth. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Control your anger. Anger in and of itself is not wrong. Anger in and of itself is not wrong. I'm pretty, Jesus was angry. Now, the problem is people who get angry all the time in the midst of their anger where they go way beyond the realm of controlled anger and they are out of control are like, well, Jesus was angry. It's like, probably not like that. In your anger, be controlled. There are going to be things that make you upset, and there should be. That is part of living. That is part of having feelings. That is part of having a sense of justice. That is part of the way that God has designed us with a conscience and to understand that things are out of order, and when things are out of order, we don't have to pretend like they're okay. And so for some people who grew up in an environment of anger, it brings back so many just difficult memories that it's just something that they just don't even want to deal with. And the problem is anger is an emotion that God has given us as a way to help us cope with things and work through things, but it has to be used as any emotion does. It has to be used responsibly and within the confines of God's original intent. And anger is just one of those emotions that is, is so easily moved beyond those confines. And he says, be angry and do not sin. There is an invitation here to be angry and yet it must be controlled. It must be controlled. But what's more is do not let the sun go down on your anger. There's a time frame and a window because God understands this emotion is so powerful and it must be constrained. He says, but make sure that when you're angry, you're in control, that that anger doesn't give you a license to go do something that steps outside of how you should respond. That's what it means when he says, be angry and do not sin that you control it, but also that you don't allow it to fester. That you deal with it. And one of the greatest problems in relationships, whether they're work relationships or marriage relationships or dating relationships or parent and child relationships, is the fact that there is anger and some of it, quite frankly, is justified, but it's never been dealt with. And so it just continues to fester. Whether it's because you don't want to have a hard conversation or whether it's just you would rather just not deal with whatever the case may be, it continues to fester. And that is a recipe for disaster. That will destroy a relationship. In your anger, do not sin. And understand it needs to be dealt with. There needs to be a season. And so I don't feel like talking about it is fine for an established period of time, but you need to revisit it soon. And you can't allow it to fester. Take off uncontrolled anger. Take off carrying around the grudge because it's something that's never been dealt with. Take that off and instead put on a healthy understanding of anger and how to respond. Because if you don't, you give the devil an opportunity. And it will be seized to ruin relationships. It will be seized to destroy people. Let the thief, verse 28 says, no longer steal, but rather let him labor, 
doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Well, I, I just I want to I want to look at a couple aspects of this. First, let the thief. I, I love this. Let the thief. Let the thief. Some of you have a past. I mean, we all have a past, but some of you you have a past, and some of you you've even got the tattoos to show the past, right? You got the tattoos. You're like, well, I probably should get that covered up now that I'm a follower of Jesus, or we're gonna have to gonna have to do a little work on that one, or I'm just gonna have to lie to everybody about what it means, and oh no, I can't do that anymore, so I gotta get it covered up. All right, some of you you really, really, really have a past, and some of you right now you're here, and one of the things you've struggled with is the past you've never forgiven yourself of, and you've never let go of, and the decisions that you've made a long time ago, or the decisions you made last week that sit there and they haunt you and they replay in your mind over and over and over again. But do you see the beauty of this? Do you see the beauty of this? He says, put away falsehood. All right, so, so what, what the Apostle Paul does here, it's, it's beautifully linguistically. He, he says, put away falsehood. He's talking about, don't, don't, don't lie. And then he says, be angry. He says, put, put away your anger, and now he makes it personal. Let the thief no longer steal. You are never too far gone for God to do something beautiful in your life. You are never too far gone to outrun the love of God. There is nothing, listen to me, there is nothing that you possibly could have done that God cannot forgive you. Nothing. And what you have to understand is God is bigger than your past. God is bigger than your mistakes. God is bigger than your faults. God is bigger than your failures. So quit holding on to them and elevating them to a place that is greater than the grace of God because God's grace wipes them away. You are never too far gone for God to do something incredible in your story. No matter your past, no matter your reputation, no matter what everybody else says about you and the stories they all know about you, no matter what, God can still do something beautiful in your life and God can still do something beautiful in your story. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let the work of God change you. For the love of God, be restored, be made new, and then change your ways. But understand, you're never too far gone for God to rescue you and do something incredible in your story and in your life. And then he says, don't steal anymore, but instead work hard. Work hard. Do honest labor. Work hard with your own hands. Why? So that you can acquire things. And then be generous. Be generous. Generosity is, generosity is a, it's just a stamp of the new self. Generosity is a stamp of God's working within you. He says, go Go work hard. Go kill it. And then under you an opportunity to bless other people and to be generous. Where you once took from others, you now give to others. That's the beauty of a God-changed life. That he can take all of the things that everybody would hold against us and everybody would use against us and everybody would whisper about us or proclaim about us on social media and point to us and talk about us and say, oh, well, I know this and I know that and I know you did this and I know you did that. And, and God just says, no, 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 no. You're not too far gone for me. And not only that, but look at what I'm going to do in your life. I'm going to change you. And we're going to we are going to change the conversation on your story. 
Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. It says, be a builder, be an encourager. Choose your words wisely, but be a builder and be an encourager. Here's the reality. Sometimes the best way you can build somebody up is to tell them the thing they don't want to hear. Now, when you do that, do that in love. But Proverbs tell us that wounds from a friend can be trusted. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. I don't remember who said it, but there was a quote that I read one time, and it stuck with me. And it said this, the problem with most people is that they'd rather be killed by praise than saved by criticism. The problem with most people is that they'd rather be killed by praise than saved by criticism. And then sometimes the best way to build somebody up is to be honest with them and tell them the truth that nobody else is willing to tell them. Be a builder. Be an encourager. That it may give grace to those who hear. And this is best done in the context of relationship. This is best done in the context of relationship where you have a vested interest, love, and concern for one another. Choose your words well. Be a builder. Be an encourager. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. The reality is this. Your conduct doesn't determine your salvation. It doesn't. Your conduct doesn't determine your salvation because you can't earn it anyways. God's standard is a standard of perfection. And it doesn't matter how good you are, as we've already seen, the message of the gospel is offensive because at the core of the message of the gospel is this, you're not okay. God's standard is perfection. And you may be really, 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 really good. You ain't perfect. Ask your doctor and your spouse. They'll tell you. They will. Yeah. And the hope of Jesus is that he was, and he is. And he paid the price on our behalf because we couldn't pay it ourselves. So understand, your conduct doesn't determine your salvation, but it factors mightily into your blessing. Your conduct factors mightily into your blessing. And he says, throw away bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice and take all of those things that are defining characteristics of so many people in this dark world in which we live, take all of those things and get rid of them and throw them away. Do not be a person who is defined by bitterness. Do not be a person who is defined by wrath. Do not be a person who is defined by anger. Do not be a person who is just clamors. Do not be a person who slanders people and who is full of malice. Take that and throw it away and take that old self, throw it away, and instead be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Giving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Put on kindness, understanding, and forgiveness as Christ forgave us. And this is why we celebrate Christmas, because this is why Jesus came. He came to pay the price on our behalf. He came to offer forgiveness to us. And here's the reality. We need to change. 
Now, the old self sometimes can feel really good. It can be fun. It's comfortable. But ultimately, it's ridiculous. And we see it on display in the world in which we live. That is full of bitterness. That is full of rage. That is full of anger. That is full of wrath. That is full of slander. That is full of malice. And in the moment, those things feel so good. But they're deceitful desires that lead us to a place of emptiness and brokenness and relationships full of tension with heartache and despair aplenty. Take off your old self. And instead, put on the new. For the love of God, change. That you would be defined as somebody who's kind. That when people look at you, they would see that you're tender hearted, that you are quick to forgive, that you are willing to become angry about the things that make God angry, but that anger is confined. That you are somebody who speaks the truth. In love, that you use your words to encourage and to build. And that you, every day, look more and more like Jesus. By taking off the old outfit. And putting on the new. Let love define you. Let forgiveness define you. Let kindness define you. And let the light of God radiate within you. In this dark and desperate world in which we live. This is the hope that we have as followers of Jesus. And this forgiveness is available to us because God humbled himself And came to set us free. And that is why we celebrate Christmas. So let's make sure that we wear love, kindness, encouragement, control. And we'll stand out in this dark world. God, I pray that as your followers, we would be people who display your love. I pray, God, that we would be people who speak the truth, even in the subtle things, that we would control our anger, that we would build people up, that we would be encouragers, that we would look in our lives and see what areas of our lives we need to work in, that we wouldn't be defined with anger and rage and malice and bitterness, slander. But that love would come in and it would rule. Because we understand that you are the source of love. It was the forgiveness you offered us by dying upon a cross for our sins and raising again three days later that set us free and made us new. So help us live accordingly, we ask in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.